This week at SpaceX, witness the stacking and testing of Booster 10 and Ship 28 in preparation for IFT-3. Additionally, a new booster began its stacking process and construction began on a new parking garage and office building. All that and more this week at SpaceX. Starting off this week in the early hours of Friday morning, the chopsticks lifted Booster 10 off its transport stand and set it down onto the orbital launch mount. The extent of the work done while it was back in Mega Bay 1 is unclear, but presumably it is now launch ready. Once the vehicle was secured to the mount, the booster quick disconnect was extended and connected to Booster 10. Later that morning, the now operational door on Mega Bay 1 was closed, depriving us of our new view of the three rockets remaining inside of SpaceX's Booster Bay. Over at the Massey's outpost, one of the new vaporizers at the back of the site was picked up by one of the cranes and moved as crews continued to outfit the developing site. Steel deliveries continue to roll in for the Star Factory expansion. Meanwhile, the next row of columns and the interconnecting steel have started to be installed on the ring yard side of the current phase. On the road side, the front row of columns has almost reached the joint between this phase and the previous one. At Sanchez, the fourth and final column of what appears to be the eighth segment of the next tower was installed onto the assembly jig. In short order, two steel beams were added to connect the column to the adjacent ones. Over at the payload processing building, the door was open for a delivery. The Spartan Services telescopic crane that arrived in recent weeks was visible inside of the building offloading mysterious equipment from a truck. It's not clear what this equipment is or what this building is being used for at this point in time. Make sure you let us know what you think's going on in the comments below. That afternoon, back at the launch site, crews were spotted installing piping to the new horizontal cryogenic storage tanks. Recently, workers have been adding pipes that will connect the individual tanks into the pipes installed on the racks in the front. By the flame deflector tank farm, the formwork now appears ready for the concrete roof on the new building. Once the concrete has been poured and allowed to cure, the shoring and forms will be removed, leaving behind the heavy-duty concrete structure. Some venting was spotted that same afternoon from behind the liquid oxygen side of the orbital tank farm. As the venting continued, one of the new pipes that redirect the subcoolers boil off over the blast wall partially frosted over it as nitrogen vented through it. Back at Sanchez, SpaceX's GMK-7550 crane moved several tower assembly jig column bases. It's not clear if this was just housekeeping at the site or if they were being moved in preparation of starting assembly of another section in the near future. That night, a booster liquid oxygen tank section was moved across the ring yard and parked in the staging area outside Mega Bay 1. This is the first section we've seen staged for stacking of the next booster, which will presumably be designated Booster 14. Over Friday night and into Saturday morning, Ship 28 was removed from the engine installation stand and placed onto its waiting transport stand. Once secured, it was disconnected from the two-point lifter. Next, SPMTs picked up the Flight 3 Starship and rolled it down Remedios and onto Highway 4. Shortly after 2 o'clock in the morning, the ship arrived at the launch site. Once there, it was taken to the orbital pad and eventually rolled in between the chopsticks. Saturday evening, as crews worked to prepare for a full stack, a test was seen of the door that covers the connections on the ship quick disconnect interface. A few hours later, preparations were complete and the chopsticks lifted Ship 28 off of its transport stand. After raising it up the tower, Mechazilla rotated the ship over the top of the booster and slowly lowered it into position, making small adjustments as it went. After setting it down, the ship was lifted again slightly and adjusted before finally being properly seated atop Booster 10. On Sunday afternoon, three separate tests of the igniters on Booster 10 could be heard. That night, Ship 28's transport stand was moved back over to the launch mount area, signaling a coming D-stack. Then in the early hours of Monday morning, the chopsticks once again took the weight of the Starship, this time lifted it off of Booster 10. The ship was then rotated over and lowered back onto its awaiting transport stand, with this full stack having lasted just over a day. Once D-stacking operations were completed, a concrete pump truck was set up at the launch site. 
Over a period of several hours, the concrete was pumped up and into the formwork for the roof of the new building near the flame deflector tank farm. With the ship back on the ground, crews were spotted on the top of the hot stage ring, working on the clamps that are used to attach it to the ship. The attention in this area immediately after destacking could well indicate that there was an issue with the interface between the ship and the hot staging ring that required a destack to fix. Over at the Sanchez site, assembly of the presumed eighth segment of the next launch tower continued. Crews were seen installing the diagonal steel beams from the middle of the horizontal beams to the nearby legs. Across Remedios Avenue, two new cranes were spotted in the parking lot behind the Stargate building. These new cranes are likely in this location to help with the construction of the expected six-level parking structure. Meanwhile, on the other side of the Stargate building, the two-point shiplifter used to lift S-28 off the engine installation stand was spotted on its stand back outside of High Bay. At the Star Factory expansion, steel crews were erecting the final section of steel that is in front of where the current phase of the expansion meets the previous phase. On the other side of the previously completed section of the nose cone hall, a concrete pumper was spotted placing concrete in the area that was recently dewatered. Down at the orbital tank farm, racks and pallets of prefabricated piping sections line the side of Highway 4. Crews continue to install the piping to the new horizontal tanks at a steady pace as SpaceX works continuously to upgrade the tank farm. On the other side of the mount, welders were busy installing the final pieces of steel armor on the tower's concrete base. These steel plates should help protect the base and is a welcome upgrade given the extensive spalling that was seen on the tower following the previous launches and testing campaigns. Tuesday afternoon, a crane was seen removing the temporary pressurization plate from Ship 28's quick disconnect interface, indicating the chopsticks would be lifting the ship again soon. A short time later, Mechazilla lifted the Starship once again. This time, the ship was only lifted a short distance and held there. It is likely that after spending the day working on the hot stage ring side of the connections, crews needed access to the bottom of the ship to work on the connections there. First thing on Tuesday morning, it appeared that crews had addressed the concerns with the interface between the ship and the hot staging ring. Once again, Ship 28 was lifted into the air and moved into position above Booster 10 on the orbital launch mount. Slowly, the ship was lowered into place, completing the second full stack of Flight 3's vehicles this week. Back at the build site, another test barrel with the pins arranged for smaller heat shield tiles was seen being rolled across the ring yard and over to the scrap yard. Unlike the first test barrel, this four ring barrel also had pins arranged for normal sized tiles lower down. This again suggests that the smaller tiles will be used to cover at least one of the section seams rather than using glued on tiles. Nearby at the Star Factory expansion, the steel workers began to install steel onto the foundations in front of the previous phase of the building's construction. Columns are being placed right up against what had been the front wall of the building. It is not clear yet if the wall panels will be removed later or if they will remain dividing the new section from the previous one. On the other side of the current construction, crews continue working to expand the building back towards the original section of the rocket factory. Late Tuesday morning, a concrete pump truck was seen spotted extending its boom towards the base of the orbital launch tower. Crews then began pouring concrete into the gap between the newly installed steel plating and the concrete foundation behind it. By adding fresh concrete behind this new armor, SpaceX will create a uniform support behind the plates to prevent any buckling due to the shockwave from a launch or static fire or impact from debris. Back up Highway 4 at the presumed parking garage construction site, the HSL-248 lattice boom crane that arrived recently was picking up a piling rig to begin placing new structural piles as part of the foundation for the new construction. Nearby, workers were busy building the rebar cages that will be lowered into the holes to provide additional strength and stability to the piles. Back at the launch site, workers extended the access platform on the ship quick disconnect arm. They then began the work of removing the covers from the ports on the ship's interface and connecting cables to the vehicle. Once preparations were complete, the ship quick disconnect extended and connected to ship 28. A short time later, a retraction test was conducted. Once the test was complete, the quick disconnect was attached to the Starship once again. 
A few hours later, after being rolled across the ring yard, the small tile test barrel was spotted being quickly and unceremoniously scrapped. A concrete pump truck was once again spotted working in the area between the Star Factory and San Martin Boulevard. A recent discovery of a filing with the Texas Department of Licensing and Regulation tells us that SpaceX is planning to add a five-level office building to the Star Factory. It seems likely that this is what will be built at this location. At the Sanchez site, additional cross bracing was seen being installed onto the currently under construction section of the next launch tower. It seems that crews are making quick work on the assembly of this section and have already largely finished building the basic structure of this module. At Mega Bay 2, crews were at work adding the final cladding to the building. This area between the roof and the top of the windows was the last remaining uncladded area, and by late afternoon, the final panels were installed, seemingly making the upper level of the building weather tight. That evening, the new door on Mega Bay 1 was opened. With this look inside, we were able to see that SpaceX had moved Booster 12 from the center work stand over to the one in the back left corner that was recently vacated by Booster 10. Less than two hours later, Booster 14's common dome section was spotted coming out of the Star Factory and moving into the ring yard. A short while later, the first section of Booster 14's liquid oxygen tank was moved into Mega Bay 1. With that section out of the way, the common dome section was moved into the staging area next to the building. Once the ring shuffle was completed, work began up above. A crane lifted a beam up to the top of the doorway for installation across the opening. Around midnight, an SPMT picked up the two-point lifter on its stand outside of High Bay and started moving towards Highway 4. The two-point lifter then made its way down the road, eventually arriving at the launch site. This is the first time one of these lifters has been brought out to this launch site. The SPMT eventually parked the new generation of ship load spreader along the road towards test stand B. It's not yet clear if ship 28 will head to the test stand for a static fire following the full stack testing, or if this load spreader is maybe in anticipation of ship 29 beginning its static fire testing campaign in the near future. As Valentine's Day dawned in Starbase, another concrete pour was started at the presumed site of the new office building. With the filing calling for this building to be over 300,000 square feet, this new construction will mark a massive upgrade to SpaceX's office space, just the latest in the large scale and rapid expansion of the area. With Starbase now bathed in sunlight, we were able to get a better look at the presumed Booster 14 common dome section outside of Mega Bay 1. It appears that SpaceX has made some slight adjustments to the liquid oxygen tank vents on this next Super Heavy. Down at the launch site, the chopsticks open into the launch position as SpaceX prepared for a day of full stack testing. As crews work towards clearing the area and into spooling up the tank farm, things seem to hit a bit of a snag. Workers returned to the launch site and were seen changing out a pressure relief valve on the methane side of the orbital tank farm. Once repairs were completed, the area was cleared and testing moved forward once again. Heavy venting was seen from the farm, launch mount, and tower as the pipes were chilled down in preparation of propellant loading. Eventually, propellant started to flow into Ship 28 for a short time before SpaceX appeared to abort the wet dress rehearsal. Looking to still get the most out of the closure, however, SpaceX performed a test of the flame deflector, blasting water up and out from the water-cooled steel plates beneath the launch mount before opening the road back up to the public. With the testing finished for the day, it was time to replenish the tank farm. With the farm still venting and the subcooler still frosty, tanker trucks began rolling in and lining up to offload. As the afternoon wore on, the door on the booster bay came back down, once again blocking our view inside the building. That evening, a flatbed with an interesting delivery was spotted on the side of Highway 4 near Sanchez. We are not yet sure exactly what this open steel box will be for. If you have any ideas, knock yourself out in the comments below. Over at the Star Factory, crews continue to work late into the night. With columns up against the wall of the previous phase now installed, the corresponding columns along what will be the new front of the building were moved into place. Meanwhile, another section of Booster 14's liquid oxygen tank emerged from the Star Factory and began making its way across the ring yard. A short time later, the Super Heavy's common dome section was taken inside of Mega Bay 1 and the recently emerged section moved over to take its place in the staging area. 
By Thursday, with the main structure of the tower section now completed, crews began adding in some of the other steel. Smaller steel pieces were lifted in and installed on the interior of the section, framing the central opening of the elevator shaft. A second delivery of an open steel box was spotted nearby Remedios Avenue. This one turned down the road towards the Rocket Garden before turning and heading between High Bay and Mega Bay 1. Behind the Stargate building, a longer auger string was assembled onto the drilling rig mass seen previously. This is likely to be for continuous flight auger piling. Work also continued at the top of the doorway of Mega Bay 1. With the door now installed and operational, steel is being added across the opening to support cladding to protect the door mechanism and conceal the door when it is opened. The light of this new day gave us a good look at this next section of Booster 14's liquid oxygen tank. Luckily, the new door was also open enough to allow us to see the already stacked first two sections of this next super heavy booster. Next door, steel work continues on the Star Factory expansion. Roof beams are now being installed onto the tops of the columns that were installed recently in front of the first phase of the nose cone hall. On the back side of the step down section of the building, new framing is being installed for a parapet wall. This wall should give the appearance that the first two parts of the building are the same height, even though they are not, allowing for a cleaner line for the factory's profile. An excavator was spotted leaving the Star Factory construction site. This may indicate that foundation work on the building is nearing completion. Yet again, a concrete pump truck was busy at the site of the presumed office building. With this building supposedly having five floors, the foundation will likely be fairly substantial to support the taller structure. Down Highway 4 at the launch site, work continues on the upgrades to the orbital tank farm. The final pipe stands are now being installed in front of the last of the new horizontal cryogenic storage tanks as crews work towards plumbing in the new hardware. Workers took a lift up to Booster 10's grid fins, where they were later seen welding reinforcements onto the Super Heavy around the grid fin sockets. A concrete pub truck arrived at the launch tower once again to continue backfilling the void behind the new armor on Mechazilla's concrete base. By the D2 gate, the prefabricated electrical hut was once again lifted and repositioned by a crane. In that same area, still wet concrete was visible as crews worked to fill in the stretch that was recently excavated in this area. With the United States celebrating President's Day this coming Monday, SpaceX looked to show their patriotism with a flag on the top of the orbital launch tower. Crews unfurled the flag Thursday ahead of testing before the holiday weekend. In the middle of the launch site, crews returned to remove the formwork from the freshly placed concrete roof for the new building there. We can see that the roof slab is quite thick, likely with a good amount of rebar inside it to allow the roof to withstand the fury of a Starship launch. Switching over to Florida, Bob returned to Port Canaveral on Friday with the fairing halves from the PACE launch. On Sunday morning, Shannon cruised back into Port Canaveral after recovering the Axiom 3 crew following their splashdown. That evening, Bob headed out to sea in anticipation of fairing recovery operations for the IM-1 Nova C mission. The next evening, Doug also headed out to sea, this time in support of the USSF-124 mission as SpaceX's maritime assets prepared for a busy week. On Tuesday, a ship came into Port Canaveral carrying the port's new Liber LHM-600 crane. Given the increased launch cadence from SpaceX, the upcoming new Glenn from Blue Origin, as well as normal cargo traffic for the port, a new crane should help with the new heavy workload. On Wednesday afternoon, Falcon 9 Booster 1078 took to the Florida skies as it launched the USS F-124 mission from Space Launch Complex 40. About eight minutes later, as usual, the booster came down screaming back out of the sky as it performed its landing burn and touched down at landing zone two. Less than eight hours later, in the early hours of Thursday morning, SpaceX launched again from Florida. This mission, launching a robotic lander for intuitive machines, marks the first lunar launch from historic Launch Complex 39A in over 40 years. A short time later, Booster 1060 lit up the Florida skies once again as it lit its engines before touching down at landing zone one. And there you have it, another SpaceX and Starbase weekly update brought to you by Lab Padre. 
Don't forget to hit the like and subscribe button if you haven't already, and we'll see you next week. Thanks for watching. Lab Padre out.